pretty, well I had up until this the past year, pretty well-rounded uh, life as an artist. I uh, retired as a geologist and I do commission work, had several really nice ones. I do the fine art, I teach, um, going to schools. Um, and uh, I also make little things that are easy to sell, like switch plate covers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Chain pools. And, um, and you see some of the work I've done as commissions in front of you, but my real love right now, my real focus is uh, I go out and I collect the rocks in Alabama and I cut them and I make <coughs> mosaics. And so that brings me back to mosaics. It's a very ancient art. It started um, about, uh, well, there's some debate whether it started in Egypt or Mesopotamia, but it was around 3,000 before the cross when the first mosaics were made. And mostly they were used as pavements because they were pretty, of course, they were really, uh, they withstood a lot of traffic and they were pretty and they did all kinds of genealogical, or at that time, I guess it was their religious beliefs and those mosaics, they were a teaching tool. And then they eventually went to walls and ceilings and so forth. If anybody's ever traveled to Europe, you've seen the, uh, some of the mosaics that are in the cathedral. So my training is actually a very classical in that style. And so going to the Chicago school and going into this contemporary wild stuff, which isn't very classical, um, was a big shift and a lot of fun. <clears throat> Let's see. So, oh yeah, so really by working with local stone, we're stepping back to 3000 BC. By working with what you can find out, out just going out your driveway is really what they did. They found their stones and their materials locally. And uh, this is an example of a piece I did with the Arts Alliance for uh, teachers wanting to bring mosaics back into their classroom. And I just went out into the, my backyard and while I was walking and I collected these little stones and we made these little fish. And so um, you can really make some very nice things just collecting locally. Um, and I'll pass that around. So we're really uh, stepping way back and connecting with our roots so far, so long ago. And uh, that brings me to where we are now. So now, it's just sort of an intro, very quick. That is uh, Alabama geology. Now this, this I think has a really strong glare. Can you see it? Or you have the little piece in front of you also. So the thing about Alabama that is most amazing to me, when I moved here, I moved here in um, 1882. And I had been a working geologist in the West, and I didn't know very much about the geology of Alabama. But when I found out, I was just stunned by the diversity and the beauty of it. But one thing that inhibits our understanding of the geology is because it's covered with, uh, it's just covered with vegetation for the most part. And that makes, the, unless you're up on, um, on some kind of a mountain, Mount Chiha, and can kind of get a view of some rocks, you really don't realize the variety. So if I was to just go through and strip all the vegetation off of the surface of Alabama, you wouldn't see these colors are just for illustration, but you would see the same forms and changes in color. You would see like tans to uh, darker browns to yellows and so forth that we might see with sediments. So what you see here is actually what we're standing on no matter where you are in Alabama, there's a different kind of rock. We have some of the oldest rocks in the nation in North America, uh, right over here in little um, Al uh, Auburn area, it's at Chihuahua Park. Some of the oldest, and they go, they extend up into Pine Mountain, Georgia. Oldest rocks in the, the country. And um, we have one here. <coughs> Not collected um, at the park. <laughs> and that is the, um, 
Paulus Courtside. This rock dates way, 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 way back to before the uh, nation was even formed. It was just like this old law about the ocean. So um, then it went through a lot of transformation and a lot of history to get to the point that it's at right here. But it's one of my favorite stones to work with. And then if we go, and then all of these rocks, this is what, this is um, Chambers County, Randolph, Talladega, to give you some idea. Uh, Birmingham is right here, Montgomery is right here. So all of these rocks are very hard. They've been squished, they've been heated to the point that they change, they metamorphose, they change. So they started off as one thing and they changed and transitioned into something totally different. And these rocks are also very unique for the country. And then we move up into the valley and ridge when you're driving up the interstate, you see those big plateaus off to the side and um, up here and then the, the huge plateaus when you drive up into like Hudsville's right here. Um, um, Talladega, no, um, Tuscaloosa over here. No, um, Tuscumbia. Tuscumbia, yeah, over here. So uh, we go up, and these are also fairly old rocks. The youngest are right here because at one time all of this area was covered with ocean. And as the land rose and um, the uh, sea level started to drop, it was depositing different layers of sediments. So that's why you have this interesting kind of a pattern. So I think that trying to combine art and science is a very fascinating thing in this case. Not only that, but one of the flora and fauna of Alabama are controlled by the geology. Because if you look at the rivers, and the river courses in Alabama, it's all defined and controlled by the geology, the underlying geology, and the, how it's structured. It defines how the rivers flow, and a lot of the rock type, the chemistry changes, and that means that the plants that can grow on those rocks are different. So if you have different kinds of chemistry in the rocks and you have different flows of water, you're gonna have a whole different variety of um, flora and fauna. And that's why Alabama, up until I think it's still the true, but I haven't checked lately, we, were, we had the third highest biodiversity in the country. And one of the reasons is the geology, our, our, we're a very temperate climate, that's very important, but we also have a lot of water, and that creates this perfect combination for having this high biodiversity. Just incredible, really. And then we have this huge diversity in rock. So um, that's my, here's Greenville, so it kind of gives you an idea. Now, my favorite rocks, the one I just showed you is the uh, Hollis Quartzite, it's over here. Wetumpka has a very beautiful rock called a schist, S-C-H, and I label them here, and it is one of those rocks that went through a lot of changes, so it has a lot of mica, it has a lot of mica in it. People love mica because it's always so shiny, it's very shiny. <laughs> I mean, it's very <laughs> when I teach kids, it's like, it's so shiny, so they love it. And um, it also is easy to break apart, and, that, and that's very helpful. Um, and then one of the, Let's see, I was six, and that is, we also have these highly metamorphosed rocks up near um, Lake Martin, which we have right here. These are phyllites, and a phyllite is like the precursor to a schist, where you can see those micas. The phyllites, the, sh the grains are so tiny, you can't really see the micas in there, but they're there. And the uh, Waxahachie Slate is one of my favorite rocks to work with, and that's just north of um, Montgomery. And um, 
Um, they're, they're beautiful slates. They're gray and mauve and pink. And you can find some the Talladega slates are very dark in color, but the Waxahachie slates are pretty cool and the changes in color. And I have big pieces here and smaller pieces that I've cut for you. Then, coming to one of the most famous rocks in Alabama that is known worldwide, except it's not really known that much in Alabama, <laughs> is the Silicaga Marble. The Silicaga Marble, if you were to go to like the Carrera Marble quarries in Italy, they would know about Silicaga Marble because it's equivalent, really new, in many of the veins that they, that they mine up there. And it used to be mined for um, sculpture and for um, making um, you know, columns and so forth. Now it's mined and it's ground, it's beautiful rock. It pains me to say it, but it's ground up and it's used for industrial purposes. But Silicaga has some of the most beautiful marbles. And really, I won't say in the world, there are other marbles, but it, it, it is equivalent. It holds its own. And the uh, Italians used to come over and quarry in the Silicado uh, quarries, and, um, and then they would ship this back to use it, because that's how fine it is. It's, a, it's beautiful. There's the, they were looking for this white, but there's a gray, which I think they call it blue. But to me, it's more gray. And then um, there's a pink that is just really amazing. So, does the pink also come from silicon? Oh, yeah, there's a vein of pink, and it is, it is pink, and I didn't um, bring a piece that I used that, but uh, it's, it's not as widespread, the vein of pink is not as widespread as the white, but you can find it. And, um, and the thing is that they don't care about these little pieces, you know, like this or that big. So I can just drive the back road and they just toss this stuff out and I can just pick up these big pieces of stone. They're interested in the blocks. They're interested in taking down a hillside and smashing it up. So it's easy to find. Most of these things I find by driving road cuts, hiking back into the, the hills. Um, so they're not that hard to find. And then the last one we'll be looking at is the Pottsville sandstone, which I collected it here, but it actually, it's this, if you see this light yellow, it's a pretty pervasive unit and um, the Pottsville formation right here. And I love working with it because all, most of these what we, we call cleave, it cleaves, and that's when you can take like a book and you open it up and you have the pages, the leaves in the page in the book. And you can mostly cut slates and fillites and schist and also this quartet, which is why I love it. Usually you can't cut it into these thin pieces. Um, but the sandstone, I can cut into I can cut it into cubes. I can cut it into triangles. I can you can't really cut it into these nice little slivers, but you can cut it into different sizes, different shapes of um, cubes, which are technically the old. If we go back again, three thousand years or two thousand um, or one hundred BC, the favorite shape to use was a cube or a rectangle. So uh, that's the uh, possible sandstone. And um, there, that's easy to find. Cliff faces, it just kind of falls off the cliffs, so you can pick up a lot of different stones. So these are the ones that we're going to be working with. And um, I also have shell that I collected down at the beach. And I have different kinds of glass up here. And one of the reasons why um, these pieces of glass are so small is because glass and shell are just really um, something to embellish. It's, it's like um, wearing a necklace or earrings. You know, when you're working with these, these stones, you don't want to. So I have one here. And this 
this one has the quartzite and the schist and the slate. I think I put just about everything on here. And I put other kinds of little minerals, but if you have just a little bit of color, it pops. It really pops out. So I didn't want to tempt you with big pieces of glass, because a lot of people love the glass. They're just drawn to these colors. It's like, oh, I've got to have it. Ah, oh, they're so beautiful. Kids do that. Adults do it. So these little pieces really force you to use them just as embellishments and not as a major part of your mosaic. And so that's, this piece is um, made primarily with slate and then, of course, the shells. And this is called fern wood. And um, so the ferns are made out of the quartzite over there and the slate. But then I did the little embellishment with the color. So, that gives you another example of how to really sort of use that, think about it, and use it. And this is a nice example. I love this piece. This piece has won many awards, but when I've had, uh, I've taken it to critiques, like mosaic critiques, and everybody's like, oh no, that just doesn't work. And I'm like, well, we won an award. We won two or three. So um, what they don't like about it is that there's all this, um, this thin set exposed, which is my style. I love to just leave the thin set exposed and not just fill the whole thing, which you don't have to fill the whole uh, board. And the other thing is, this is an example of using the sandstone. And I just took the little cubes and I tilted them up so they were kind of at an angle like that. And these are just giving you examples and ideas of, um, and we're going to talk about how to think about your design. <coughs> I think I'm pretty much there at principles. And you have this little form, I think, that um, So I was trying to debate whether to 
show you. So here are some small examples, and these are more like what I think we might try and make today. And um, and you can have one, but one of the other rules that's important is that that one is not dead center. You want to have it offset somewhere. So one is interesting if, for example, my focal point here obviously is the circle, right? And it's just one of them. <laughs> so it's set high, and it has all this other stuff going on around it to make it interesting. But if it's more interesting here than if it had been just right here in the center. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, so when you're thinking about So we have a rule of odd numbers. You also have a rule of thirds. And so a lot of times if you're working, let's say, with square, you break it into thirds. Well, in abstract and contemporary work, there is what they call a sweet spot on this. And these, these intersections are really the the important intersections to think about when you're placing um, your pieces. But the, the, what's called a sweet spot is right here. That intersection, they just, the eye and the brain like to see the uh, focal point in that space right there. And, and it's really unusual because every, not unusual, it, Every piece I've sold where I have my focal point right there, or every piece I've made with a focal point right there sells right away. People just pick it up and they buy it. <laughs> and I don't think, I think it's just their brain going, oh, something's interesting about this. And it's this, it's this position right there. Um, another thing to keep in mind is how the eye travels. Our eye naturally travels because of the way we read and so forth. We're just brought up with it going from left to right. But it also likes to go in this direction, left to right. It's more energetic. There's more energy in a piece if you decide to put your pieces so that the eye moves from, from uh, let's see, left to right, from left to right going up. It's a, there's more energy. There's also more energy if your pieces are like this. Of course, it's like people standing up. That's interesting. But if you have your pieces in a more horizontal, that's a very calm, it's a very calm piece. It's not, a, you can think about landscapes or whatever. So when you're thinking about placing your pieces, um, this is a natural eye movement. The other thing you don't want to do is uh, some don'ts. I, I recommend, you can do whatever you want. I just recommend um, that you don't put something in the center. Or how can I put that? Center. No. <laughs> um, you can try it. You don't want to divide your square into a half. It, it's not as interesting. I mean, you can. You can. It's, um, it's your, your piece. You'll be free to have, make it however you want, really. That's OK with me. And, um, and so if we go back to this piece, we have a lot of energy because these little pieces are going up and down, and then a lot of energy down here because it's chaotic. And this piece is centered up here. So again, it pulls the eye, and everything's going up, and everything's a lot of energy. In terms of how the brain sees it, you're not, you're not physically you know, thinking, ah, oh, look at that. But in, in, if you, I guess, subconsciously, there's an attraction to that. Or there might be repelled 
from it. What you want at that moment is something calm. You don't want to look at something like this. You want it nice, calm. You want a landscape sort of thing. So um, those are the basic tools, I think, that you can uh, work with. Oh, the other is a variety of sizes. Vary the sizes. And it's, uh, I equate this to music. I don't know if you sing or you play music or you read music or you listen to music. But if you just have a steady boom, That's not very interesting. So if you can change the how long the note goes, or how short the note goes, or how high it goes, or how low it goes, that is what really makes music interesting. And it attracts the person. So in the many of the classes, I don't know, for mosaics, we often equate mosaics to music. And in fact, I have a friend who takes have people bring in their favorite piece of music and make a mosaic based on that piece of music. So if you were to look at notes, who reads music? Anybody read music a little bit? Yeah, but you know about the quarter notes and the half notes and, and they're the short notes that all. So what makes this interesting is that there's a variety of sizes. And think about that. The little notes with the little uh, arms on them you know, they're short, they're quick, and then the big whole notes, which they might call whole notes, are just big empty circles. And they're long, and they kind of hold your place. So when you're making a mosaic, that's the same thing is happening. You have the bigger pieces and the middle pieces that are holding, sort of holding you. And then you have the more vibrant, moving pieces that um, move you around. So these two are good examples of using the little odd numbers and having the pieces moving, uh, the smaller ones and the bigger ones and so forth. And then, um, that's so high. This is a really great example. <coughs>
Can I ask one question? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say now questions. Open up for questions. Anything you have? Right. We're not there yet, but we're getting oh, there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, I'm not going to leave you to yourself on that. You actually have the tool in front of you. And I'm going to do a demonstration with the tool I use most often. So we've had the principles. And now... Um, oh, yeah. And the other thing is you don't... I'll just say again, you don't have to fill in the whole, the whole square. You can leave the thin set. So the materials we're going to be using are the, the, and the technical term, I'm going to tell you that, tesserae. But the tesserae, um, that's the technical term for, just one more, for uh, the, the pieces. Tesserae, if it's plural. <laughs> so, uh, and the other thing we're going to be using is a thin set, which is a cement based material, and that is what they would use down in the kitchen, in the bathroom, whatever. So um, we'll be mixing that up. And that's what those little cups are for. And that little spatula is to help mix. And you have a spray bottle on your table. So um, let's talk about the materials. So. Everybody has a pair of nippers, and I don't know. Nippers are the easiest and the, well, one of the most uh, common things to use for cutting. But again, I'm going to go back to early, the early mosaic, uh, I guess, workmen. They used, and you can, there are actually mosaics and carvings and so forth and, and paintings of uh, people back in Roman and Greek times using something just very similar to this. This is a chisel embedded in wood with a they're pretty sharp. Well, this is kind of dull compared to others, but um, the sharp end. And then this is uh, the hammer that is used. And so the sharp end and the sharp end come down together, and you um, cut the. So this is how I cut most of these. So you were asking how we cut them. And people can try this. I brought my not so good hammer. And that's why I brought my dull chisel here. But, um, but a lot of people don't want to try this because they're really terrified of, uh, So this is how I cut most of my materials, using this. It goes really quickly once you get into the river mode. You go bang, flip, bang, flip, bang, flip. Much easier and quicker than those nippers. But, um, Can I ask a question? As you're working, do you cut per piece, or do you cut a bunch and then use? I cut a lot, and that's another tip on here, is and what I recommend today is that you prepare all your materials first. So I'll cut, and I'll cut, and um, I hopefully will have enough to last me for a week and working on a piece, but maybe not, and then I'll take a whole day set it aside and just cut. Because otherwise, you really slow, the, you slow it all down a lot if you have to cut in place and cut and cut in place. Now, I do that on some pretty intricate pieces sometimes. Everything's cut, but then I may have to shape them a little bit. So that's a good question. Um, so, okay, with the nippers, I have a uh, I'll just use these. Everybody's got the same kind, so you've got to have a duty one. It's not kind of anything. 
So, um, and these are pretty heavy duty also. So you can, the thing about the nippers, is you have the jaws of the nippers that'll come together here. So if you're looking at it, the jaws come out into the center, right? Well, um, the thing you want to do, and now if I was to draw that, looking at it from the top, what you don't want to do is put the piece all the way in or you'll just shatter it or you won't be able to cut it at all. You just put in maybe a quarter or an eighth of an inch. Here's your piece of whatever it is, sandstone. You put it in just a little ways, because really it's just physics. So I put it in just that far. You don't put it in all the way. If you do, well, you'll know right away that you won't be able to cut it. You won't be able to squeeze it. So it just goes in about a quarter of an inch. And then what you do, and this is where everybody goes, oh, okay, I'm going to cut it now. But what you really want to do is hold on to the other end. And so while you're squeezing the other end, you can cut it. So um, you can try that one. Yours are what? Yours are also wider than this one. I should have laid these out earlier. Um, Crystal. 
still in rock, so it makes a little more. And then, if you want it long, you just put it the long ways, and we'll see how good it is, because sometimes it doesn't work. So now I have this thin little piece stuck in there. So if you're doing a slate or the fill eye, this is a little bit harder to cut. But, um, let's see. So what I want is a long, thin little piece. So I put it in like that, and then I squeeze the other, squeeze the other, and that's the physics. You have a point of pressure to a point of pressure will go across in a straight line. So I say, okay. Now, we didn't do it. We flew off somewhere. But that's what this court set is. It sometimes just does its own thing. So anyway, that's the, that's the idea behind it. And you can just practice and work on it. And I'll hand these around. And in the meantime, uh, we're going to start working here. Think about what you want to do and um, what you might be interested in doing. And what I recommend is uh, that you put your, turn one of your note pieces of paper over and just draw the outline of your board. Unless you're an art teacher, you might just feel and um, just make some, just kind of make some little rough sketches, what you think you might like to make. What I would recommend is um, to think about making a star pattern at first. You could use one or two. So this is my demo, and I'm going to work on it a little bit more with you just to demonstrate it. So a star pattern is you can have a focal point up in the sweet spot, and then you could radiate out from there. You could radiate different size pieces out from that point. If you're not sure what you might want to do, that's one, one thing that you could do. And then, as embellishment, you can add the glass and you can add some shells. One thing I want to say about the shells, don't just add one, you need, or, or it becomes the focal point on your piece. Anything different on a piece of art, the eye goes right to it. So if I was just to add a shell right here, you wouldn't see any of those stones, you just go right to that shell. So you need more than one shell, you need several, to, uh, so the eye kind of moves around the piece. Unless you want that to be your focal point, like my Okay. So cutting, get that. Any other any questions about that? Okay. So um, what I suggest you do at this point is we have bins. I have these bins up here. Oh no, I put them on the table. So those little black bins are for you to collect your stone. And for the glass, I have these little cat, cat food dishes. <laughs> um, you can collect whatever uh, type of glass you might like. Be careful when you reach in, some of the glass is sharp. Um, so why don't you, uh, you can just start with your little drawing. You can start by collecting your materials and thinking about what you want your focal point to be, like say you're going to do your star. If you do your star, what material do you want to use? Here, you might want to use the, a big piece of sandstone or quartzite or something. And then think about, do you want it to radiate out that way and this way? Um, and what materials you might like to use. Some people are very, um, I guess, they're, I had one student that every time she took a class, everything ended up very geometric. And so she would, um, she started off 
and her pieces just started to go across. It was interesting, they were different sizes and so forth, but she just started making this grid pattern, really, is how her brain, and I didn't know that, the first one she did, and then we did these other things, and when she came in, she started doing, that's how her brain worked, she just made grid patterns. So, um, whatever you think you might like, you can start with the materials, come up, take a look, feel them, see which one of these might appeal to you. You can come over here and go, ooh, I really like that. Now that could make a nice focal point. No. Or I might have a collection. You can do, you can collect two or three together, I mean, yeah, two or three, to make a focal point. To make a shape that you like. So stand up. Come over and look at the materials. Okay, she had a good question that I forgot to mention. And that is um, the tines of the nipper, if you're left-handed, the tines would face to your right, or the inside line of your body. If you're right-handed, the tines are going to point to the left, again, the inside. And then you have to take it off better.
show. You might need another one or two here because those aren't going to work. You need bigger pieces. They're so okay. small. But then, once you get your big pieces laid out, however you're going to lay them out, mm -hmm. see, that's this is a focal point piece. Mm -hmm. You could put that there. Like, I'm even wondering if I want to do more thin set here cause, uh -huh. and have it darker and then have my stones here. Uh -huh. You know, like, to get, is the thin set dark? Well, then black. Perfect. So it would be dark. Uh -huh. And then I could have more of my stones. Yeah, but see, I'm just saying, that way. your focal point, the big stones are here and they get smaller. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the I will be drawn to the big piece down right. here. Right. So, um, however you do it, however you do it, you, you can start to arrange them. Mm -hmm. And then you come in with your tweezers. Mm -hmm. And put those where And I you wanna... had your little black and you had, I mean, your yellow. <clears throat> and you can sti stick these on their end. Mm -hmm. You can stick them up like that. <laughs> and then you can put these in between because you've left enough space. Mm -hmm. You're not going to fill in the whole thing. That's you right. just put them enough so that, I don't know where they are. Oh, there they are. So here. And you just start filling in. Uh -huh. I mean, I'm just doing that. Uh -huh. But you set the, the big pieces first. Okay. Then you fill in with the little ones instead of the other way around. Okay. Because it's just too hard otherwise. Right. So once you get this and you say, okay, so my spiral's going to go this way, mm -hmm. or however it's going to go, it probably should go that way because it's going to go out that way. Okay. Does that help you? Sure. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I'll go get some bigger ones. <laughs> to get, get your salt. I can't. Can we begin? Yes. Okay. Yeah, most everybody looks like they're ready to begin. Now, remember, we're working in stone, not glass. Thank you. I think it's sunset. Oh, you want to come do it? Am I doing it wrong? Uh, well, everybody's mixing, so let me just okay. do it one and one. Okay. So the thing to do is you've got enough to cover the whole. Okay. Where is this starting? Uh, top corner I'm moving down. Or not corner, but. Like that's going to be yeah. up in here? Mm -hmm. So what you want to do is spread an even amount. And kind of scratch it in so it keys into that sand that is uh, glued in. That's what's going to hold the thin set to the board, is making sure that it all gets down into the, between the sand grains. And then I just even it out. It's like a frosting a cake. And make it as even as you can and you need to so if you work pretty fast Nina, does there any more water with the solution um, no here just uh, yeah, cover the I'll, whole thing I'll do it, yeah okay you're going to run out of the glass of water starting over uh -huh. again uh huh This is pretty good. Okay. How do you feel about this? Thank you. This is pretty good. Thank you. Yeah. So we'll just add. Thank you. Just stir it up there.
Come on. I mean, maybe a different color. Mm hmm. <clears throat> mm -hmm. That's what I'm thinking. Swirl Dee, are you getting our voices? Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the country geek is in the background. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> <laughs> It's the saving. It's very deceiving. So have y'all find any more games this weekend? This is the first one. This one is the first one. Okay. So you know they're they're pumped. We did. How was that? Um, we ended up just watching it online, but it was pretty good. I enjoyed it. It's pretty. It's Teeny tiny piece of green, but I don't think like you can get it in there. So if your pieces are kind of falling off or they fall off, it's just when the whole thing's dry, you can use a little Elmer's glue and just glue them back in. Okay. Once you get started and you just go with the flow, just let your 
let it go. You come up with some amazing things, especially I like the changes in orientation and direction of the line. And so the focal point, where do you think it is? Right. So you really pull it, it pulls you in on the focal point. But then it has a nice complementary. This really sets it off. So you have some strong points throughout. And I did try to use the uh, sweet spot and then the, the directional pull that you talked about uh-huh. going up uh-huh. into the wall. So. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> <laughs> OK, thank you. She has to go uh-huh. teach a class. Thank you. OK, well, then we'll just pull this lovely one up. can always test. What falls off? OK. Um, this one is, I'm going with Ms. Rind- Ms. Day's idea. Um, it's abstract. It started off as kind of an idea of something off in the distance in the ocean, um, and then just kind of added to that. So. Oh, something in the ocean? Like something, like this would be off in the distance, like if you were standing back here on the shore, then that would be off in the distance in the ocean, and just kind of added to that. Oh. So the shells, what do you think of the shells? I like how you stood them up, up there. Yeah. And really pulled the ocean idea in. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So the focal point, and what do you think of this line that goes along around the outside? How do you how do you read that? How do you read it? Not just whether you like it, but I like it as a barrier. Like that's where your starts are. Uh huh. Uh-huh. I feel like it kind of leads you back around. It does lead your eye. No, it's good. Yeah, I lead your eye, and that's helpful to move around a piece. I always think about how does your eye move around a piece. That's so important. Because, you know, the eye can get stuck in a piece. It gets close to one place, and if it doesn't have anywhere to move. Um, so I'm just going to pick them up at random. You're careful. Staying in place. Okay. Okay, it was just um, my little take on the universe. The universe? Yeah. Got different planets and different stars and stuff. Can you point out the planets? Like in here uh-huh. and down here. Uh-huh. And the different energy coming off of them. That's really cool. No, that's a pretty cool idea. And the red, what made you use that red? I just love red. Uh-huh. So uh-huh. that kind of makes it stand out to me. But I understand you were saying that the red really takes your eye to that. Uh-huh. So yeah. yeah. But that's good because uh, you didn't use too much. Mm-hmm. Could have been just a few less pieces, but you were restrained in your love of red. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so that it's not overpowering. Red can overpower. It's just beautiful. I think that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. Nicely done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. These are um, also cool. I just love them. So um, there's like two meanings to it, but my husband's family is all from Silicaga, so I thought it was really cool when she brought the Silicaga marble to use it there. Um, but that's a side note. But anyways, it's supposed to be like sunset because sunset's my favorite time of the day to watch it because it's the end of the day. So there were like rays coming off of it in different colors in all different directions. And I wanted it to be super calm, so I did the straight across. Because uh, it's very calming to me. Yeah. No, that's really cool. Any other ideas? Does it strike you? A little bit almost like a camellia. Yeah, I was going to say it makes me think of a rose or, or something like that as well, just the way it's a, um, the pattern of the, the sun. Mm-hmm. I love the texture of it. I really love the texture. The odd, she's just got them in there at odd angles, and um, if, you, if it's in the light, like daylight, you'll see those odd angles. The light's going to reflect off the glass in different ways, which will be really pretty. That's really nice. That's nice. I love that you have a connection with Silicaga. That's one of my favorite places. I could spend a lot of time there. Now, is this the way it goes? Yes, or is that's it? the right. Okay. Yeah, that's the way. Thank you. Okay, let me 
it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so I just got done teaching a story in third grade called Kumak's Fish. And it's a very dramatic story about um, this family and they go fishing and it's snowy and so he puts his like fishing hook down in the water. And so I kind of put this is like the fishing hole and where they're fishing. But he can't pull up the fish because it's too heavy. It's again, it's a tall tail. So he has to get all the villagers to come help him. And so they all like line up like in a circle, like this behind him to help him pull it out. So I just <laughs> envisioned that as I made it. Um, and I thought if I like share it with my kids, that would be something they would relate to too. Um, and then all of this is just, I just kind of flowed with it and made it a little dramatic and added some color because I like color. So, yeah. I love that story. <laughs> It's a cute little story. Oh, that's that's so awesome. that stuff is falling off of mine. That was okay. I think you just bumped into it, but it's not going to detract. No, from it won't. So. Cool yeah. story. Thank you. Wow, fishing hole. Okay. See, these all look best from the distance, don't they? I, I, I always step back when I'm working on mine. I step back. It's that dance, they talk about the artist dance where you step back 15 mm -hmm. feet, then you step forward, and you step back. Mm -hmm. oh, um. The color in this from a distance must be amazing. Mm -hmm. I've just seen it up close, but I can just imagine it's pretty cool. I, I don't know that I really had a, a, a big plan for it. I knew that I wanted to use the white, um, and I loved how you could use them on, on I don't know, I guess they're bias or whatever. Um, so, and I like the colors. Uh, it's abstract. There is really not a story to go no, along no, no, with it at all. That's good. And I just, it was fun to start somewhere and just kind of go with it. Mm -hmm. um, I think the material itself lends itself to its own mind. And that's, we were kind of talking about that. It's freeing not to have to make it be something. Uh, and I really, particularly like that. There's a couple of shells that are added in there, kind of in, it's almost like a puzzle, just trying to figure out your pieces. And, and I thought that was interesting to look at the shells and be like, wait, that one doesn't work. Um, but yeah, I, I loved the, the red stone there, but these pieces kind of picked that up as well. So just trying to use color to move your eye and line to move your eye. I think it's very nicely done. It, your eye does move, and um, it's very geometric, but it's not uh, um, uniformly geometric, you know, so it really, your eye moves around it, and it's like, that's good. And I love, I love the use of that, that red. Very good. So when these dry, you can, um, Paint the edges and frame them. I think it goes like this. Or did it go like that? Well, I had it like that, but I may like it. I may like it better, like like, like you had it. Like this. <clears throat> um, or like that. <laughs> I actually like it vertical. I think now. Mm -hmm. I like it vertical. That yeah. I see it mm -hmm. that way, but basically, I guess I was more inspired by kind of a Van Gogh movement swirl is what I was going for. And we all talked like, I started off with a plan, but I really enjoyed the process. Like, just, I feel like just seeing how it all fit together and how you could, you know, either place it on its side to make thin lines. I really loved the texture that it made down here um, and seeing how it all fit. But, basically just going on the spiral and I'm an art teacher so I wanted to include the Roy G. Bibb in there and create some movement. So. Beautiful. The colors are nice. Thank you. The colors are great. Do you remember the wrong thing that Dr. Bullen built at Sorrel Chapel? It had a name. Oh, I remember it. Yeah. And where you walked it. Yeah, you walked yeah. in and you get the serenity. Yes. Oh, yeah. I 
it's a prayer. Uh, yeah. It's for meditation. It's a meditation. Uh -huh. So can't think of the word. Okay. So honestly, I picked up this piece of marble first, and I was like, oh, it's a moon. Um, <laughs> so that's where I went. And uh, we've been camping a lot lately, so I was just feeling a lot outdoorsy, and I was like, it was a moon. So I, made, I don't know. I'm just going to go down the mountain and into the green valley. So. Yeah. <laughs> I think uh, what I really, I like this. Your eye just keeps traveling around and around this piece. It just moves. And maybe this sets the tone, but then these little white pieces just help your eye keep revolving around. I love the colors. Yeah. Like that green with the, the terracotta reddish stone is just. The yeah, the idea was to go down, like start the mountain and go down to the valley and it's green. So. Okay. Um. I love that one. <laughs> Um, so I came up and I picked up those two rocks first and then I just picked up some random little ones and then I got back and I placed them together I thought well that looks like a storm cloud and so I combined two things that I love the color purple and weather I love bad weather and I love the color purple so I made a storm cloud with rain coming down. I love it. <laughs> I love bad weather too. I do. It's fascinating. I know. <laughs> yeah. So that's a. So I see that now. The rain and the storm coming down off of that. Do you like, call it purple rain? I <laughs> think <laughs> 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 Thank you all so much. I just want to make two more comments about what you might be able to do with your students. Um, there are different kinds of substrates, and um, I don't think I, one is the wood that we worked with, but you can also just get these little ceramic tiles. They're very, very cheap. You can get a hundred for like ten dollars, a little less. And, um, but it's good for just using Elmer's glue and uh, making small little things. I just collected these stones. This was, well, I told you already what this is for, but um, so the stones are easy to find. It's out. You can find them walking. People, they, when they do sidewalks, those little stones in the cement, the concrete just get washed over. The other thing is this um, cement board, which is also not too expensive and is uh, used for Tile installers use it. You can find it at Lowe's or Home Depot. The one that's more expensive but is also nice wouldn't use it for a class unless you were going to do a big mural. It's completely weatherproof and it's called Weedy Board, W E D I. And um, it's styrofoam with a cement uh, a mesh and then a cement, base, cement on either side. So, the, so they use it for showers and baths and things like that. And, um, completely weatherproof can go outside and but expensive so if you were doing a big project it would be worth it but in this climate so is this this is works too it's a cement board um, is that like hardy board or? no hardy board is a little bit different a cement board is cement between two pieces of mesh and hardy board has a lot of filaments and things in it and uh, this is less expensive, and I like it better. It's easier to cut. You can cut it with an X-Acto knife. Um, then you gotta toss it and get another X-Acto knife because it's cement. So anyway, that's, I think, I think that's about it for the class. I want to thank you all. And do you have any last minute questions? Before everybody gets away, make sure I gave everybody a coffee
the Johnson Center across the street. And if y'all will, just stop over there. And it, I don't know that everything's out on repo. Luke came in, she said, that one is planking. I'm going to have turned off right now. But <laughs> anything you want to turn on, you'll see a switch. Just turn it on. Yeah, I recommend that's Vince Bewalda. Oh, gosh, yeah. you got to see his stuff. It's just incredible what he can do. And um, it's so creative. It's amazing. It's the most active one I've ever seen. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very, I, everything moves. And there's more toast and snacks over here. So take some of the Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, if you have any questions or you have uh, you want to do anything with your class and you have questions, you can email me.